Hi, I'm Mary Ann Smith, and today we're going to talk about age-friendly health care and systems in relationship to medications. So the goals for today are to overview medication in the context of 4M's care. We're going to briefly review screening and then talk about some interventions. I'd like to acknowledge that this program is one in a series of eight about the 4Ms and is co-sponsored by the SOME Center for Gerontological Excellence and the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program at the University of Iowa Geriatric Education Center. The content is based on the age-friendly initiative of the John A. Hartford Foundation and Institute for Healthcare Improvement. We really, truly hope that all of our users will join the movement and visit the link listed on the slide. So medications in the context of the 4Ms is a really interesting and dynamic topic. On the one hand, medication is critically important to the health and well-being of many older adults. It's used to treat acute and chronic illnesses. It can improve function and a sense of well-being, reduce suffering and distress, and actually increase longevity. At the same time, medication risks are ever-present. Age-related changes in terms of universal changes that occur in, as we age influence how drugs work in our bodies how they are metabolized, how long they stay in our system, and how they affect our well-being. We also know that as we age, we tend to have more chronic conditions, multiple chronic conditions. And as we have more chronic conditions, we see lots of specialty providers who don't necessarily talk to one another. And those specialty providers prescribe additional medication, lots of medication that all have risks. Drug-drug interactions, drug-disease interactions, adverse effects, unexpected effects. And then we start thinking about all those over-the-counter drugs, all the stuff that gets advertised on television about how it's going to help us, that older adults may or may not report when they're talking to their providers. And we think about all those opportunities for using lots of medications, medications to interact with one another. And then we think about the cost. And the cost is financial, meaning what are we paying in terms of money that might be dedicated to something, to doing something else like what matters most. And we also think about cost in terms of the burden of taking all of those medications on a daily basis. So the point I'm trying to make is that medications have benefits and they have risks. And the 4Ms framework really emphasizes safe use. We want medications to promote function and well-being so that older people can do what matters most. We know that medications impact the other M's. As we talked about in the mobility module, mobility is greatly impacted by drug side effects and can increase the risk of falling. We know that medications can directly cause depression, delirium, and increase confusion in dementia. So medication has a huge impact on mentation. And doing what matters most may not be possible due to drug burden. As I said before, both what is it doing in terms of ability to function with drug side effects and adverse reactions, and what is it doing in terms of the cost? So as before, we need to think about the 4Ms as they interact with one another, not as silos. The IHI and the age-friendly movement 
recommends that medications should be age friendly if they're needed. So if needed, use age friendly medication that doesn't interfere with what matters to the older person, their mobility, their mentation, and think about medications being used across care settings. This is really incredibly important, the piece of that across care settings. So back to being age-friendly and our key actions, we start with assessment. So we want to review for high-risk medication use, and we can do that annually or a change of status. We definitely want to use a team approach and in, in using established criteria for identifying high-risk medications and drug-drug interactions. We want to then act on our findings after we think about medications that may be high risk and think about deprescribing, that is taking them off medication or not prescribing high risk medications in the first place. And we want to think about how we go about that in terms of gradual dose reductions, discontinuation, and again, avoiding high-risk medications in the first place. So there are a number of things that we can think about, these helpful tips about how we assess medication. An important starting point is to think about the setting or practice culture. What are the resources that are available to you in your setting, in your care practice, to actually improve medication reviews? How are high-risk medications being prescribed in your setting? What are the ones that are most frequently prescribed? What's probably a good practice for championing deprescribing? How might that look in your setting? I think the goal that we are trying to establish is don't be overwhelmed with medication review. Uh, start where you are. Think about your practice, your culture, your resources, and then start where you are and start moving it ahead. One of the tips that the Age-Friendly Systems uh, Guide offers is that a good starting place can be thinking about existing prevention protocols, like for delirium and fall prevention, and thinking about how those might already include guidance to avoid high-risk meds and then building on those existing practices and extending drug review procedures to other people, not those that aren't necessarily at risk for delirium or falls, but thinking about drug review of high-risk medication as being part of what could be done for all older adults. And we certainly want to incorporate drug reviews at the time of transfer or discharge. One of the most important things to remember is that medication that may be prescribed on a short-term basis in acute care or post-acute care may not be needed for longer-term care. So short-term use for specific symptoms is really important, but letting those medications linger on and run the risk of having adverse effects as they accumulate and interact with other drugs poses a lot of unnecessary risk. So the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or IHI, says that the high-risk medications in our review should include things like benzodiazepines, opioids, highly anticholinergic drugs, sedatives and sleep medications, muscle relaxants, tricyclic antidepressants, and antipsychotics. So our aim in this, this area is to review for these medications at minimum, engage, screen, and assess the person's current medications and what are their current needs. I'd also like to acknowledge that the IHI list is one of, of many lists. The 
bigger goal really is to think about the drug's impact on function, quality of life, and how it might pose a risk to the older person's independence through sedation, cognitive impairment, unsteadiness that leads to falls and injuries, unpleasant side effects, adverse reactions, and drug disease interactions. So there are a lot of really great resources online available today related to high-risk medication. Let's look at a couple. So one of the most important uh, criteria for high-risk medication is the Beers criteria that is developed and provided by the American Geriatric Society. You'll see on this slide that there is a DOI number, which if you type in, will take you to the journal article that talks about the Beers criteria, what they are, how they were developed, how they're used. There's all, they're also available at geriatric, geriatricscareonline.org, which is the resource center for the American Geriatric Society. And there you'll find a pocket card that's foldable and has eight pages of really terrific information. And if you want to just Google Beers criteria, that will also bring you to a lot of terrific information about the Beers criteria that is very much more expansive and inclusive than the list provided by IHI. We also know that the high-risk medication list that's provided at our own Geriatric Education Center is an exceptionally strong uh, resource, if I do say so myself. Uh, and I, so I highly recommend that everyone visit our Improving Antipsychotic Appropriateness in Dementia Patients, or IADAPT, website, where you will find pocket cards that look a lot like this. And as you can see, these are cards. This particular card has a long list of drugs, specific drugs in categories, anticonvulsants, pain, psychiatric, antihistamine, Parkinson's-related therapies, etc., that have these nasty side effects that put people at risk. So we want, I think this is just an exceptionally strong resource and hope that everyone will visit our site uh, to explore the resources that are there. When we think about assessing medication, it really is important to put it in the context of what matters most to the person. Some older people are very happy with taking multiple medications and somehow feel secure in, in that. Other people are just not quite confident. It seems like a lot to keep up with. So ask the question, what's most important? How do their medications facilitate what is important to them? How might their medications impede doing what really matters? How much is enough? What is a burden? Just in, sheer, just in terms of the, very, the sheer number of medications that some people take, managing, you know, three, four times a day, before meals, after meals, with meals, it gets very complicated. And then what about the cost? What is that doing to them in terms of keeping them from maybe engaging in activities that are in fact more fun and more important and more meaningful? Is it time to think about stopping some medication based on their age, based on their state of health, based on wanting to do more of what matters, in particularly if medications are getting in the way of that? So, Let's go on and we think about assessing and thinking about high-risk medications, the Beers criteria, the IHI list, how we can maybe do some assessment, simple assessment, building on our strengths in our own practice or care environment. 
Then the next step is really to act on what we now have learned. So we want to focus on the person's goals. What are their desired health outcomes and preferences? And if we need to prescribe medication, let's always work to prescribe age-friendly medications, ones that don't have side effects, ones that we can help prevent problems and treat conditions while avoiding those high-risk drugs. And we also want to think about de-prescribing, dose reductions and discontinuation. As, this, as the cartoon character says here, sometimes less really is more. We also want to work on the side of prevention. prevention. So avoiding high-risk medication is a top priority for all older adults. And then after that, the next most important question is, what matters most? What are the person's health outcome goals? What are their treatment preferences? Is medication a burden? If so, how? Too many pills? Too much cost? Too little benefit to justify continuing the medication. We also don't want to start drugs unless they're really needed. Now, that seems really simplistic, but there are times when we could consider are there non-drug interventions? Are there alternative approaches that might be actually safer and as effective? As we talked about in the module about depression, behavioral activation, physical activity, and talking therapy are all very effective in treating moderate depression. So there may be times we don't need to add an antidepressant medication and could instead add a behavioral intervention. Is there a way to promote sleep without using drugs? What about sleep hygiene? What are the practices that we can really encourage to help people sleep and sleep well, but without using drugs? And what about exercise and activity for pain? as opposed to adding opioids. In so many different ways, there are opportunities that we may not automatically think about because writing a prescription for a pill is so much easier to do. We also want to think about time-limited trials of medications followed by gradual dose reductions. And this is important in the context of acute care, where there may be situations where an older individual really would benefit from a low dose of a benzodiazepine or an antipsychotic because of an acute confusion that is really troubling to the individual. But doggone it, get them off that medication as quickly as possible. Think about how long they need to use it. Stop drugs that aren't working or that are no longer needed. And certainly avoid prescribing cascades, meaning that there is a tendency to treat the side effect of one drug by prescribing another drug. So instead of backing away from a drug that may be causing the side effect, reducing it or discontinuing it and seeing if this pesky problem persists, we had yet another medication and away we go with more and more medication burden. This is particularly important with psychiatric drugs, antipsychotics that are used for delirium that have, and, and, and that are used to treat behavioral symptoms in dementia, and certainly those benzodiazepines that are used to facilitate sleep. Short-term use is almost always best. In terms of medication, another piece that I think too often gets neglected, and that is educating the older person and their family care partner about what their medications are and why they're taking them. 
So we definitely want to engage and educate our older clients at the time of discharge and as part of their ambulatory care. We want to keep it simple and understandable, but we also want to be comprehensive. We want the person in the family to understand what each drug is for. That is, what is the indication? How do they take it? Why they take it? and how to monitor their outcomes. Is it helping or is it causing adverse reactions, side effects that are really unwanted? So we want to also just in general help older adults understand the notion of high-risk medication. Uh, there's probably not enough public awareness about risk associated with some medications. So we want to create opportunities to talk about how the medication works, that there are times when reducing the number and the dose of the medication is important. It's alternatives are often available, both drug alternatives uh, as an alternative to the high-risk medication, and also non-drug approaches, and that there are also times to just stop taking a medication. So there are a lot of really wonderful educational materials and brochures that can be used to advance knowledge and understanding of medication use among older adults, and that I think are also incredibly important for family care partners to read and understand so that they can be supportive. One of the better resources uh, that's available online is called healthinaging.org. There are a number of really just exceptionally good educational materials available at this website. And as the screenshot says, medication and older adults is the page we're looking for. One of them is 10 medications to avoid and, and or use with caution that is only two pages long and that is highly consistent with the IHI recommendations and offers names and types of medications and reasons that they should be avoided. So returning to the idea of there are times to de-prescribe, and I think we've talked a fair amount about the triggers, you know, continued use isn't need for, the need for the medication isn't really clear, there are side effects, we've somehow gotten ourselves into a prescribing cascade, and we, oh no, now we're seeing mobility problems, falls, other, you know, cognitive impairment, side effects that are signaling that the medication may be doing its job, but it's causing a lot of hazard. So at that point, let's think about backing it off. So to do that, we also understand there are barriers. I mean, there it may be a real need for the drug in spite of the fact that it's having an adverse reaction in the person, the treatment-wise, they need it. There's also a lot of issues that go on with providers in interaction among team members. Oh, I'm just too busy. Oh, that takes a lot of time and intention to figure that out. I just don't know that I can really deal with this right now. There are also trust issues between the older person and the provider. In having a conversation about reducing or discontinuing a medication, it's incredibly important that there is trust and good understanding and confidence that this is a worthy topic and one that we should explore together. And it also spins on the person's belief system that they may think that medication is really needed for their health and taking them off medications is a little scary. And there are also concerns about the cost of a non-drug treatment. Can I really afford that? or time needed to take or taper. So while there are indications for de-prescribing, we also have to acknowledge that there may be some real life barriers. But I'm here to say there's nothing on the side of de-prescribing barriers 
that we can't overcome. And when it is time to get rid of the medication, it's time to have the conversation. And we can build the trust and we can find an alternative and we can make it so. So when we think about alternatives, so there is an ongoing need for the medication, okay? But this medication is causing us side effects, something that we don't desire. So let's back it up and think about what are the best alternatives? And so the NCQA list uh, offers really nice alternatives in terms of category of drugs, alternatives to high-risk medications, and a real strong strategy for thinking about what is an alternative if we are not wanting to use, or rather shouldn't be using that high-risk med. There are also wonderful online resources, and again, many thanks uh, to Ryan Carnahan uh, for identifying the deprescribing network uh, that is also identified in the IHI guides about forum care, and that offer really clear, specific guidance that helps providers and teams deprescribe confidently and safely. There are algorithms for deprescribing, videos for clinicians to watch, pamphlets to hand out to our older patients and family members, empower brochures to help older people understand and really work toward uh, the importance of avoiding high-risk medication. And certainly there are templates for pharmacists pharmacists to communicate with prescribers and prescribers to also communicate with their patients. So lots of terrific resources. This is a page, this is a very large screenshot with very small print, but I think that it gives you the idea of how an algorithm is laid out. This one relates to benzodiazepines. And as you can see, it's a flow chart asking you questions about why is the patient taking a benzodiazepine? Well, what's the answer? Then where do we go from there? Recommend deprescribing or perhaps continue it. So lots of great information working stepwise to help providers think about what is the next best step given where we are. And this is the page two of that same algorithm that offers information about the benzodiazepines and the doses that are used and additional information about how to engage the patient and the caregiver, how to think about tapering, what about behavior management, and use of cognitive and behavioral therapy, which is a really super intervention for getting people uh, to think about alternatives to using anti-anxiety or sedative hypnotic drugs like benzodiazepines. So some additional uh, information from deprescribing.org is this handout that's actually provided to give to the older person themselves. So very important uh, information here that we can use, you may be at risk. Think about it. And then not just giving handouts to older adults, but using it as a conversation guide. This is why I would like to be having this conversation with you. There's also uh, really great information, if I do say so myself, at the Geriatric Education Center uh, last year, our center gave uh, their whole geriatric lecture series on the topic of deprescribing. So if you would like to learn more about deprescribing, please do visit the Carver College of Medicine continuing education site that is listed and consider enrolling in one of the topics that is listed here on the slide. So in summary, Medications are highly important for so many people, 
older adults in particular. At the same time, they have a lot of risks if we're not paying good and careful attention. So we want to identify and document those high risk medications. We want to use a team approach, starting where you are and then expanding. As with all of the ants, this is not a single person's job. We need to think about teamwork and we need to think about building on where we are and the resources that are available in our setting of care. We need to think carefully about what matters to the person and then educate and engage them in decision-making about their medications. We want to always use age-friendly medication and avoid prescribing high-risk medications and also de-prescribe them at the earliest possible moment. Thank you so much.